Hello, hi, welcome everyone, and we'll get started. Thank you, Janice. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay, uh, and you guys can see my slides. Um, so again, my name is Jizia, and I'm a pharmacist at the Moncton Hospital, and uh, my main clinical practice area is in um, the ICU. And so I was asked today to talk about the, um, the use and the study regarding the vitamin C cocktail that we use in sepsis. Um, so I will lead you through this study today. So first of all, let's meet a patient. So this is a common patient of ours in the ICU. So it's a 61-year-old male. He's admitted to the ICU, well, first through eMERGE, obviously, with uh, septic shock. Um, and it's from a community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, he has a past medical history of hypertension and some diabetes. Um, he presents to eMERGE with a, a fast heart rate, low blood pressure, a high respiratory rate. He's got a temperature. He's losing his uh, level of consciousness. He's in and out. And he has a massive speed of production. Um, his labs on presentation, he has a high white count of 23, a creatinine of 355, producing very little urine, um, a lactate of 6.1, and a high glucose of 19. Um, the decision is to intubate him and ventilate him and transfer him to the ICU. Um, so at this point, we do the typical um, standard of care. Uh, so we're drawing... Blood, set, uh, blood cultures and a sputum culture. We start him on a uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, we give him the required fluid bolus of crystalloids, and he is then started on norepinephrine and vasopressin, um, and we are reaching max doses of these drugs. So the question then becomes, are we going to add hydrocortisone? And from the surviving sepsis guidelines, cortisone or hydrocortisone is always in the uh, literature, it's always like, yes, no, yes, no. So then the ICU, ICU team looks at around and says, should we add this vitamin C cocktail? And so the story begins. So why should we worry about sepsis? Well, as we know, it's a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated inflammatory process. And it's basically results in a massive release of different cytokines and inflammatory toxins, which basically leads to decreased organ perfusion and impaired oxygen de delivery, so it's an oxygen demand supply. But it's also down to the cellular level where we have mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, there's a direct effect of the immune response to the infection. And there's microvascular abnormalities as well as endothelial dysfunction. So we have vasculature, and it's hard to kind of keep your uh, your fluid in and your uh, being able to pump through the system. So sepsis globally affects about 19 million people a year. And the mortality rate, depending on the type of country, so, you know, in first world versus third world countries, but mortality rate's about 30%. And if you are um, with septic shock, it's up to 50%. So basically, you know, one in every other person globally is dying from septic shock. And as to date, antibiotics, source control, as well as your supportive therapy um, are your mainstay. Um, and current therapy for sepsis. And so there is an urgent need to have cost-effective as well as easily accessible therapies for sepsis. So Dr. Merrick, um, from the pul he's a pulmonary physician from Virginia, USA. He had an idea. And it's not just, you know, he just oof, thought about this idea overnight. Based on some science um, over the past few decades, he had three patients in front of him, you know, consecutively-ish, um, that were basically dying in front of him from sepsis. And he didn't know what else, what to do. They were on uh, antibiotics, the appropriate antibiotics. They were supported with your vasopressors. Fluid was given, all the measures, and they were still dying in front of his eyes. So he thought perhaps 
if we go back down to the molecular level and see what we can do, perhaps we can help save these pa patients. So he treated three patients with septic shock with a vitamin C. And as we all know, we need vitamin C to sustain life. It's in one of the essential vitamins that we, that we need. So he also decided, okay, well, we need to add hydrocortisone, and it's basically for synergy, which I will get into. And what he noticed is all the three patients made a dramatic recovery with no reported residual organ dysfunction. So as you can see, most of our septic patients end up in renal failure on dialysis. Some are it's, uh, transient and some are permanent. That's one of the organs, as well as, you know, it could be liver damage, et cetera. So this inspired Dr. Merrick to design a study to investigate the hypothesis of whether vitamin C does help cure sepsis. So why vitamin C? So 40% of patients with septic shock have extremely low levels of vitamin C. So if they take your vitamin C level before, when you come in with sepsis, you are less than, generally speaking, less than 11. And most patients are undetectable amounts. And so basically you're in an acute scurvy state. And as we know, in an acute illness results in um, acute levels of vitamin C. And basically what you're happening is you're consuming your vitamin C more than you can actually produce it or release it from, from the adrenal cortex. So they've shown that lower concentrations of vitamin C are associated with severe organ failure and an increased risk of mortality. And that the most likely explanation is basically we're consuming too much of our vitamin C. Vitamin C, like cortisol, is a stress hormone and we're released by the adrenal glands. And as we, I don't know if any of you guys know, but humans and guinea pigs, we're the only mammals out there that cannot produce our own vitamin C we have to get it exogenously through our food supply. Uh, at some point, we lost uh, the mutation um, in one of our genes, the Julo gene, that helps the last step biosynthesize vitamin C. And so, but animals, most other animals, can produce their own vitamin C. And so the theory is that perhaps other mammals do not um, have this huge stress or vulnerability to sepsis as humans do because they are able to produce their own vitamin C and probably produce more under a stressful response. So in sepsis, we have an excess production of reactive oxygen species. So basically we are producing as oxygen is being consumed, we are producing free radicals. And as we all know, vitamin C is an antioxidant, and it helps scavenge and uh, clean up all our free radicals. It also helps recirculate some of the, the proper um, antioxidants, like vitamin E as well. And so what happens is if you have too much free radicals, right, we're damaging our, the cellular membranes, the intracellular junk junctions, and basically we're leading to vasodilation, um, your endothelial barrier is not properly intact and you have, you know, edema and then we also have like uh, coagulation disorders. And so as we give vitamin C, we can counteract some of these um, free radicals. And as well, vitamin C is an essential cofactor required for the synthesis of catecholamines and vasopressin. So basically it's an endogenous vasopressor. So we need it also to help with our sympathetic nervous system. And it also helps improve the binding of our endogenous vasopressors or, or catecholamines in the body system. So you can see it's kind of a precursor or it's a necessary um, vitamin to help with um, our natural catecholamines. And so the question is, why IV vitamin C? Why can't we give orally? And as I said earlier, we have to ingest um, our normal stores of vitamin C on a daily basis just to kind of to sustain life in a way. But in an acute state of sepsis, 
you deplete your vitamin C so quickly that and uh, giving it orally would not, you wouldn't get to levels high enough to get back to normal levels to help fight sepsis. And as well, in our GI tract, we have these transporters that help bring in vitamin C, and they are saturable or saturatable at 500 milligrams of oral, oral vitamin C. And in order to, to replenish our stores of vitamin C, we need anywhere up to three grams or more. So the need for IV and for the need for IV in, in the sepsis trial was basically because we consume it so quickly, we need to correct it rapidly because of the acute scurvy state and because we don't we only have so many saturatable transporters in, in our in our gut. So then the question is why thymine? So why did Dr. Merrick add thymine to his vitamin C cocktail. Well, as we also know, vitamin C is also deficient in acute sepsis. And we need that to, it's one of the enzymes that we need to help produce um, ATP. And so sometimes thymine, we see thymine deficiencies, um, usually chronically, but if you see an acute uh, thymine deficiency, we see like Wernicke's and it also mimics like beriberi. So you have like lactic acidosis, which is leading to vascular um, shock. But it was also, not only was it added because we had vitamin C deficiency, but also we use thymine to help metabolize one of the byproducts of vitamin C that potentially could lead to um, stones that in, theoretically could cause nephropathy. And so basically thymine helps minimize that conversion of vitamin C into oxalic acid or calcium oxalate. And so therefore it has renal protective effects in a way. So then the question is why vitamin C with steroids? And basically from the surviving sepsis guidelines, we know that we add vitamin C when they're in um, vasopressor, like the refractory to vasopressors, and we've maxed out our vasopressors, and we add steroids to help with hemodynamically. And if you look at the studies, it's always, it's still controversial. There's always one study that will say yes, the next study will say no, next study will show no difference. So again, in the literature, we have debate whether or not to add corticosteroids and when to add them to septic shock. But in this case, it's not necessarily added for that reason but it was added for its synergistic effect with vitamin C. So basically, we need vitamin C in order to, to concentrate into the cells at the cellular level, you need the, another type of transporter. So it's a sodium vitamin C transporter too. And that helps enter vitamin C into your cells, but those are down-regulated during the septic um, inflammatory process. And so, steroids help increase that expression of those transports. So therefore you're getting more vitamin C into your cells. But also vitamin C is also helping steroids, um, steroid receptors be more sensitive and therefore helps binding of the steroids to their own receptors, therefore also helping out with septic shock. And so usually, I'm more of a person that I visually understand you put up pictures, but I felt in this case, because it's such a cellular level type mechanism that I felt words were more important. And so here is a diagram of what is going on at the cellular level. I leave it up for like 30 seconds so you kind of absorb it, and I know you guys have slides, but basically it's very complicated, but you can see how vitamin C and hydrocortisone work at the different levels and helps with the um, scavenging of the free radicals, the ATP in the Krebs cycle, the endothelial tight junctions. So that's basically in a nutshell what the vitamin C, thymine, and um, the corticosteroids are trying to do. So this isn't just the first study that, that um, the one I'm going to talk about, Dr. Merrick's study, that looking at vitamin C in sepsis, there are numerous studies over the past couple of decades looking at the addition of vitamin C. 
And so this is just another one, but this is the one Merrick study that I'm about to talk about is the one that really kind of um, put really in force and, and people are using it in, in ICUs um, is basically based on the study, the Merrick study. So you can see from these ones, there's numerous literature to help support um, the use or the study the Merrick study. So this was the triple therapy and it was published back in 2017. So we're already two years, two and a half years out from the publication of the study. Um, some centers have adopted it quite quickly and other centers is still controversial and the whole ec the equipoise and ethical questions come in play. This was a retrospective before and after study uh, based at one center in Virginia. And those patients were included for adults greater than 18. They had a diagnosis of severe sepsis or septic shock, and they had a procalcitonin level greater than two. And so procalcitonin is a biomarker that we use. Um, some centers have it. Um, here we do not have it. Um, but it's a biomarker that we use to help, um, help define and diagnose uh, sepsis. And so levels greater than two um, usually are indicative of sepsis or severe sepsis, and uh, it can help uh, guide antibiotic therapy. Um, an exclusion where obviously it's patients less than 18 years of age, um, pregnant, and if they had limitations of care, which wasn't really further described in the study. And so the design was a single center matching to historical controls. So there was 94 people randomized or study it, I should say. Um, so the historical comparators, so basically that was standard of care based on the surviving sepsis guidelines. So everyone received the boluses, the antibiotics, um, the, the vasopressors, all, everything that we normally do. And some were on hydrocortisone and that was at the discretion of the, the treating physician. And so that was a retrospective when they looked at for seven months patients from June to December 2015. After his three patients that he noticed this miraculous treatment, he then randomized 47 people to the vitamin C protocol leading for seven months from January to July 2016. And they did a propensity score matching was used to account for confounding variables. And the mean follow-up is usually about four days because of the outcomes based on, on uh, whether or not the protocol was working. Um, the primary outcome was hospital survival, and the secondary comes secondary outcomes, sorry, were duration of vasopressors, your the need for renal replacement therapy, our ICU length of stay, um, procalcitonin clearance and the change in SOFA score at 72 hours. And the SOFA score is basically is it the severity of organ functional study. So basically we look at it to see um, how the, your organs are doing under in sepsis. And so the severity, it's all, it's basically tells you um, and helps you kind of guide with mortality and morbidity rates. So the intervention was the, um, what we call the vitamin C protocol. So basically, you were to receive vitamin C, 1,500 milligrams, so that's about six grams a day. And that was basically be, uh, chosen because of um, on the monograph as well, it says up to six grams a day was safe and effective. And this was given um, Q6 times four days or until ICU discharge. So the was, max was four days, or if you were discharged out of the ICU on day two or day three. Um, and they mix it in 100 mils of D5 or normal saline, and then you fuse it over 30 to 60 minutes. Then it was followed by thymine, and again, it was piggybacked in and infused after 30 minutes because of the synergistic <coughs> effect of vitamin C with the thymine. And, um, sorry, not the, th the synergistic effect, the um, metabolic concern about the oxalate. And then hydrocortisone was given for 50 milligrams IV Q6 times seven days, and then tapered slowly depending on the situation, and that was used for the synergistic effect with vitamin C. 
The vitamin C protocol was initiated tw within 24, the first 24 hours of ICU admission, and it excluded patients if they didn't have a procalcitonin level of greater than two. So if they had a procalcitonin level of 0.5, then they didn't receive the, the, um, the vitamin C protocol. The overall, uh, the control group was similarly matched. Um, with exception, they didn't get the vitamin C protocol. But like I mentioned earlier, it was up to the physician discretion whether they got hydrocortisone or not based on their vasopressor um, refractory status. And that is basically common practice now. Um, we add vitamin uh, hydrocortisone once they're uh, refractory to vasopressors. So you can see here, so these are the baseline characteristics of the study of the patients. And you can see overall that they're well matched. Um, about 38% of our patients had pneumonia, so 38 to 40% patients had pneumonia, and 23% had uh, urosepsis. 13% um, each had GI biliary type of infections, and these are type of common infections that we see in our ICUs here. Um, half of the patients received vasopressors, um, and about 60% had acute kidney injury. Uh, as well as about 30% had positive blood cultures. And you can see that the procalcitonin levels were about 25 or 15, um, in, depending on each group. And then you can see that they did the day one SOFA score. So they, at, at initiation, to see the severity of your organ damage and your, your mortality rates, as well as the PACHI score. And that's also another um, scale that we use to help match severity, ICU severity illness system. And so the results, um, so the primary outcome, and this is where really created quite a big buzz in the, in the ICU community as well as internationally and not just from the healthcare community as well as patients and family members requesting to have um, the Merrick cocktail, you know, added to their patients. And so you can see out of the, each group, four patients died in the vitamin C protocol in the, the seven month period versus 19 in the control period. Their ICU length of stay were about the same and that could vary just, you know, they didn't really specify, but I don't think necessarily it would change the practice. I think sometimes it could be a bed situation, um, a transferring out type of thing. They didn't, they didn't um, go into detail. But you can see the duration of vasopressors. So basically 18 hours overall, the median, the mean in the treated group versus 54, 55 hours in your control group. And, that, and that's pretty much what we see now, you know, anywhere between 24 to 36 to 48 hours of vasopressors without the vitamin C protocol. Um, the need for renal replacement therapy was 10% or 3 out of 31 in the treated group versus 11 in the um, control group. And your change in SOFA score, so a bigger change in SOFA score means you're actually getting better, right? So less organ damage. Um, so you can see about 4.8 in the treated group versus 0.9 in the uh, control group. And the procalcitonin clearance um, also decreased um, the change, decreased in your treated group. And they also noted, um, and they, they commented on the fact that, and there was another study to kind of support it, that you would see in the first 24 to 48 hours, if you don't see an exponential drop in your procalcitonin level on the vitamin C protocol, that sometimes it could be that you have the wrong antibiotic choice. So you should see a decrease in your procalcitonin, procalcitonin, and if not, then sometimes it might be that we don't have proper antibiotics. Um, so you can see this is all statistically significant, um, and the primary outcome an absolute difference of 31%, and we need a numbers, number needed to treat of about three patients based on the small, on the small numbers. So looking at it more closely, so you can see that 
the pink was the predicted mortality. So at baseline, they predicted your mortality rate based on your Apache score and your SOFA score. And you can see that in the control and the treatment arms, they're the, about the same. And then once you give um, vitamin C, you see how it dropped down as where you had a mortality rate of 8% in the blue versus 40% in your control. And these were, again, the propensity adjustment outcome, and they did a logistic, logistic multivariate analysis of the same data, and they showed the same results. So they're saying that there was a true treatment effect rather than some kind of statistical confounding with the primary outcome. The time to vasopressor discontinuation was also quite substantial in the treatment group. And if you can notice, Yes, I think we lost volume on our end. Can you check the mic and see if you hit mute by mistake? Saying that GV is no longer in the call. Can anybody else on the line hear her? I can't hear her uh, from my office. I can't hear her either um, from my office. I can't hear either from my office. I can't hear. Just trying to think who might be up there that I can text. Yeah, so I'm thinking the same thing, or I can run up, I guess. I'm a little ways away, but I'll, I'll, I can do that. Yeah. Would Stacy be up there? I can try texting her. I think that's the only person I have in my phone from Upton. I'll, I'll text Janice Higginbotham as well. She oh. was the one who set it up, so I'll see if, that, if she might be close by. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Janice is going to go look into it as well. Okay, thanks for the update, Mike. No problem.
So she's just working on it now, and I've asked her to, or to try maybe logging out and logging back in to see how that works. Okay, sounds good. Hello, sorry everybody. <laughs> there we go. Hey, Jesia. Hi, I am so sorry. So I'll go back a little bit if everyone is okay with that. Sure, yeah, that's okay. I think I uh, acted, I don't know. I don't know what happened. No, it was like Skype. So, uh, did you guys hear like, so I'll just go back to the study from the beginning and I'll, I'll quickly kind of go through it. So basically the Merrick study, it was a retrospective before and after study um, looking at the use of vitamin C protocol in patients with sepsis, the inclusion criteria, adults greater than 18, diagnosis of severe septis or septic shock, and procalcitonin levels greater than two. And we use pro procalcitonin as um, a, it's a biomarker, and we use it to, to help diagnose uh, severe sepsis and septic shock. Um, so the design was a single center matching study, and basically um, the comparator was like seven months prior. So they looked at seven months prior to, of people giving the vitamin C protocol as their historical um, group. And the vitamin C protocol was the prospective part from January to July 2016. Um, and they did a mean follow-up, usually was about four days based on the, um, which I'll get into, was the, uh, the amount, the, the duration of the vitamin C protocol. And the primary outcome was hospital survival and secondary outcomes was the duration of vasopressor, the need for renal replacement, IC length of stay, our procalcitonin clearance, and then the change in the SOFA score. So the intervention was vitamin C, and they gave this 1,500 milligrams IV Q6 for four days or until ICU discharge. So basically, was it four days or less than four days? Um, but four days was the max. Um, some patients only required 24 to 48 hours of the vitamin C protocol. And hydrocortisone was given over seven days and was followed by a taper over three days. And that was just to prevent refractory hypotension. The vitamin C protocol was initiated within the first 24 hours of ICU admission. So that's really important to know that um, the sooner you give it the better the outcome is. If you wait longer, then your outcomes probably would, wouldn't be so great. And, you know, the, the, when you think about it, it's, you've, you're letting the infection and the inflammatory process take over, and it might just be too late at that point. And in their, um, in their protocol group, septic patients, they had to have a procalcitonin, just a reminder, to be greater than two. And so if they had a level greater less than two, they weren't they, would, they were not enrolled in the vitamin C protocol during the prospective part. And hydrocortisone in the control group, based on their surviving sepsis guidelines, was allowed at the um, discretion of the, uh, the physician at the time. But again, it was retrospective, so that's why you, won't, you wouldn't see um, not everyone received uh, hydrocortisone in the control group. So basically looking at our baseline characteristics, you can see that both groups um, were relatively well matched. And if you look at the type of comorbidities, um, they all pretty much represent the type of patients that we would see. Um, the primary diagnosis, about 40% was pneumonia, 23% a urosepsis, and about 13% were GI or biliary type um, infections. And those, again, are type of infections that we would see um, in, our, in our ICUs. 50% uh, required mechanical ventilation, as well as only about 46 to 50% of the patients were on vasopressor therapies at the time. Um, they did, uh, you could see the procalcitonin levels are quite high. And so that, like I said, is, is a biomarker and it kind of helps um, guide the severity of sepsis as well as uh, it has been shown to also help guide um, the use of our antibiotics. 
and um, they do a SOFA, they did a SOFA score on day one to see the severity of uh, the organ damage and it helps kind of predict morbidity and mortality of our patients as well as the Apache scores help um, score and uh, describe the severity illness of our patients. So the outcomes come out and you can see how the hospital mortality was about 8% or 8.5 in the vitamin C protocol versus about 40% uh, in the control group. And so this made the news and not only from the ICU community, but as well um, from family members re requesting uh, vitamin C protocol being given at other institutions based on what they, what they saw, you know, the miracle juice being um, published online. Um, the duration of vasopressors was also just quite drastic and, and significant between both groups. You can see that um, 18, uh, 18 hours about in the vitamin C protocol versus about, you know, 55 hours in your control group. The need for renal, re renal replacement therapy, so dialysis for those that acquired acute kidney injury from the septic inf um, infection was quite uh, significant as well in the vitamin C protocol versus the control group. And then our change in SOFA score, so the severity of the organ dysfunction also improved in the vitamin C protocol versus the control group. Um, so again, they looked at the propensity uh, adjusted outcomes as well as a logistic, uh, logistic multivariate analysis of the same data and it showed similar results um, and so they were able to say that it was more of a true treatment effect rather than a statistical confounding process with the primary outcome and so you can see the blue the actual mortality was our predicted mortality at baseline right so if you go back to the baseline table you could see that both groups were matched, that their predicted mortality rates were about 40% in, um, sorry, in pink in each group. And then the actual mortality once the study, so your, your control is about the same versus the 8%, uh, 8.5% 8 specifically in our vitamin C protocol group. Um, the time to vasopressor discontinuation was also quite significant. And you can see, and I think this is where I lost you guys because I went to hit the mouse and hit <laughs> the red button. <laughs> um, they can predictably kind of show that over two hours, uh, between two to four hours after getting the vitamin C I'm just really cautious now. <laughs> vitamin C protocol, after the first infusion of vitamin C, that the, the, the rates of the vasopressors dropped and predictably dropped after starting this treatment. And you can see as well with the change in our organ dysfunction score, the SOFA score, as well as the procalcitonin clearance, it also showed a significant drop in changes um, with the vitamin C protocol. And then in, they also noticed that there was no new, um, in the vitamin C group, we didn't develop any new organ failure requiring escalation of any type of therapy. So those that had some degree of damage, it didn't get worse. Some actually got better. So the observations, basically, we saw that both groups had the same mortality rate at the beginning. About 60% in their control group received hydrocortisone as part of their standard care, and that was based on the surviving sepsis guidelines at the time. And usually they was added, it was added um, when you patients are um, refractory to two vasopressors, usually um, you would start um, low-dose hydrocortisone. 
Um, 22%, 22 sorry, patients in each group met the criteria for septic shock and basically were treated with vasopressors. So not everyone in the study got vasopressors, but 50%, and that's pretty much what we see in, in practice. Um, in the 22 vitamin C group patients, they had baseline levels. So they didn't check, they didn't check vitamin C levels in everyone. Um, and it's probably probably because of a cost issue. But basically, just to, to, to reiterate the point, but vitamin C levels do drop in septic shock or in, in, in critical illness. And most often, they are undetectable at less than 14. Um, and none of the patients had normal values, so 40 to 60, in either groups of patients. The four patients that died in the vitamin C protocol um, was not, they say that was not due to direct effects of the, their critical illness, but rather their underlying comorbidities. And I was mentioning to the group earlier, I can recall one of them for sure, and it was it basically it was, um, it was due to their Alzheimer's disease, the progression of their Alzheimer's. Um, and so most of them were made palliative care um, after leaving the ICU for their underlying disease. Um, in the vitamin C group, there was less patients that required renal replacement therapy. So only three patients in the vitamin C group required dialysis versus 11 in our control group. So you can see the organ damage was not as significant um, with, with the vitamin C protocol. Um, so the limitations of the study. So basically, so everyone here now, everyone's all caught up. Um, it's a single center, so it's the external validity is always a question. It's a before and after, so it's not a randomized controlled trial. So you have, you know, a prospective group and a retrospective control group. It was non-blinded, so um, everyone in the prospective group, if you met the criteria, received treatment and everyone was aware of receiving the protocol. So what was the true treatment effect? Um, because hydrocortisone use was in the control group, did that alter some of the true, the, the effect, but it's hard to say. And they don't report whether or not those in the control group received thiamine or not, or their thiamine deficiency. So again, is that a limitation or not? However, we do know that they were well matched at baseline, and the outcomes that we were measuring were objective. And um, the two statistical analysis failed to detect any type of statistical confounding issues. Again, though, it is a small sample size, 94. Um, so could that alter your treatment effect? The more you get, maybe the less effect, but um, maybe not. The fact that they looked at three um, interventions really at once, so is it really the vitamin C? Is it thymine? Is it the hydrocortisone? Um, but, you know, some people will argue that, but I feel like in this case, I think from a cellular point of view and the mechanism actions, I think it makes sense to look at all three at once instead of one on its own. Um, were the doses appropriate? Um, could they be optimized more? Could that make a change in our, in our therapy or the, the effect of the, um, the results? And they don't really report on the long-term harm or risks of um, receiving the vitamin C protocol. Um, so do we know if this is harmful or not? And that is, is also um, very controversial. And if you, if you try to follow in the IC community, you know, you have people that are purists and they're like, no, we don't know the harm, where others are like, if we take a step back and look at this, really, what are the risks? And so what about the safety? So what I could find was that basically, universally, you know, I, we don't think there's any issues with giving 400 milligrams a day of th IV thymine. Um, since this is not the first time that we've seen vitamin C in critical care studies, um, this is the first time we're seeing in combination. Um, or triple therapy, but, you know, we have literature to help support that vitamin C may have a role um, with sepsis. The theoretical concern, and usually you see it with, potential to see it with high doses of vitamin C, is the, um, the, 
the oxalate stones, the nephropathy that could to help, uh, could cause harm, sorry. So if you give too much vitamin C, could you cause renal impairment based on um, oxalate stones? But if you give thymine, technically we should be minimizing that reaction from happening, that conversion, so we minimize that risk. And the, the amount that is studied, this protocol is what we consider low dose vitamin C, and the theory is basically if you have gr doses greater than 10 or even greater than 40, which, you know, some cases you would see in burn patients that we use high dose vitamin C. And actually, in this study, the Merrick study, you do see that the vitamin C correlated with improved renal impairment, and they did measure oxalate levels, um, and they didn't see them rising in any of the patients. So basically, the conclusions are, these results are that the early use of vitamin C are effective in preventing progressive organ dysfunction, including acute renal failure, and it basically reduces your morbidity and mortality from sepsis. This is a hypothesis-generating study, and um, it requires, or most of the ICU community really does require that randomized controlled trials be done on this subject and this protocol to see whether there is a, such a true effect, and if there is, you know, a true effect, how big is this effect? But we, when we can look at it, we are fulfilling an urgent need for low cost, effective, and accessible treatment, right? It's vitamin C, thymine, hydrocortisone, as long as we don't have any issues with um, back orders. Um, so, Key points in this study, or overall from this discussion today, is oxidative stress is bad, and vitamin C helps uh, at the cellular level, um, is associated with increased, so the vitamin C deficiency is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. We need vitamin C to help to synthesize your catecholamines, so it does help, you know, with the use of vasopressors and your endogenous, as well as your exogenous use of vasopressors. Um, and it helps maintain the endothelial integrity, so your vascular structure. And we do need vas uh, randomized control trials are needed to further look at this phenomenon. So there are future trials in progress. Um, last, there's about about eight or nine randomized control trials globally looking at vitamin C protocol in septic shock. And you can see that some are in the US, China, Australia, Australia India. Dr. Merrick itself is only associated with two of the uh, seven trials, I think, that are reported. Um, and basically, there is no funding with these trials. Or they're all philanthropy uh, funded for the most part, um, so there's no company bias necessarily with um, these studies. And so we'll see what happens. So back to the case. So you have this man in front of you. He is crashing in front of you. He's on, we've maxed out your two vasopressors. You've given appropriate antibiotics. You're considering hydrocortisone. And then the team looks at you and says, what about the vitamin C protocol? So I ask you guys at this point, what would you do based on what we saw today or what I presented today? After reviewing this study, would you? Would you give the vitamin C in your sickest patients? Or you would say, well, I kind of want to see more, some more data. Yes. And I don't know. so this is now is open for discussion. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions. If you guys are still on the line, I apologize again. But yeah, the so floor is open. So we have been using um, vitamin C here in Moncton at our, in ICU. I don't know if you've seen orders, but um, I would say we're 
we've been doing it over a year now, not in all our septic patients, but the majority of our patients. Um, actually, I put one patient on it yesterday um, to see if that would help. But from my experience, um, there is more and more uptake. It's getting everyone educated, you know, and the fact that this isn't a randomized control trial hesitates. There's hesitation in the community. The availability of vitamin C was also an issue. It was non-formulary up until recently. Um, the stability of getting it, having it accessed, but um, the few times, well, not it's several times now that we've used it over the past year or more, and I can say that it there is an effect. There is a true effect, and especially if you do start it early on. I will see their vasopressors come off within 24 hours. Um, it's, you know, that's one of my objectives, that I, objective responses that I would observe when we give the vitamin C protocol. So like I said, it's really important that you give it. If you, give, if you do choose to give it, kind of, we kind of looked at what's the harm. You couldn't really find any true harm. Maybe there is, but at the time, and still at this present moment, we don't know if there is harm. We don't think there is any harm. I mean, you're giving a supplementation basically to help the cellular level again. So I don't have, you know, in-house data, but um, there is, like, yeah, our physicians are, are on board, and more and more each one are getting on board. I don't know if other centers have been using it, but Haley, you have a question? So yeah. We so we don't do the procalcitonin level here. Um, the Georges Dumont does it for us if we send it. Um, I think St. John has procalcitonin levels. Um, it is, we have ordered them, but um, again, I, it's, I think it's, it's going to be education to whether or not um, the physicians want to order. Not all physicians are on board or are aware, really. Um, but we have. The, a lot of the evidence behind procalcitonin is to help guide the duration of antibiotics that has been shown positive. Um, and so it, it's, it's something that we in the ICU need to look at adding to our, to our daily or our lab work. So that's, that's the thing, right? We're kind of the rate limiting step is getting it to the Dumont, getting it analyzed and then back. So sometimes we may not get it that same day. So it's kind of like our heparin, you know, the hit assay test here, kind of like you know, it'd be nice if we could have it, um, so then we can kind of help guide easier. Like, it would just help easier if we could do it here. Yeah. And we don't measure vitamin C levels. I've never seen a no, no, vitamin C levels aren't done. And I think, I don't know if we have the capability. I'm sure we yeah. do, but I think there's a cost to it. Yeah. But, I mean, basically from not only this trial, but other trials, looking at it prior to this one, I mean, I think it's suffice to say that our levels are pretty much undetectable within sepsis. Yeah. So um, it's important that you give, um, I don't know if you guys heard that question, but it basically is how, how important is it to give vitamin C and thiamine and so basically, I instruct the nurses to piggyback everything one after the other. So not to wait two, three hours based on the, um, first of all, think of the synergistic effect. So vitamin C and the steroids need to work together. And as well as um, you're trying to prevent this nephropathy from happening with the, um, the, the, the vitamin C, so the thymine. Um, so I try to get them to give it one right after the other. So they basically hang one, hang the next. I mean, they're looking at, um, I watched a, an, an interview with Dr. Merrick the other night preparing for this, and, you know, there's, they're trying to think, they're trying to get ways to get, like, um, you know, all three drugs in one syringe, or at least the vitamin C and the uh, thiamine in one syringe. And, um, you know, in, in the U.S., it's like a lot of field work, right? So it's, you know, you've got making, you know, diagnosis, in the ambulance, and it's like give the, the, the protocol as soon as they, you give the antibiotics. I mean, here, I don't know if that would ever come. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's more so it's the, um, the the daily dose that's important. One of the studies is looking at, and I, to me it makes more sense to do it that way, not just from the the mechanism, but also for um, the logistics. It's why not schedule everything Q6, and that way you're not missing something. So uh, one of the studies is, is taking the thymine. Instead of doing 200 Q12, they're doing 100 Q6, so still getting the same amount. Yeah, so you could you possibly could do it that way, but I mean, for now, we're, when we do use it, we're following this protocol. And uh, I was mentioning to um, to Andrew and Chantal that there was a recent came in my uh, my mailbox when I was on vacation that um, there's a stability study out there, and we'll have to get access to it. But it's looking at um, you because. The vitamin C vials are this gigantic, I can't remember how much is in there, but there's like, you're only using 10% of that vial to, to give this protocol. And so we're wasting, you know, 90% of it. And so there's um, a study that looked at the stability, and it was out of Ottawa, and it's, I think it was, looking at the abstract, it was five or seven days of stability if we mix it in the bag. So we could technically take one vial mix, you know, four days of the patients, yeah. So, you know, that's something we'll have to look into when we do use the protocol. But it, it like I said, the protocol, you know, you, you could see the mixed, the mixed uh, people, the, um, you know, do it or not do it. So. Do you hear we're at one o'clock? So I'm oh, yeah. going to wrap it up and sign off here. But um, I think you'll probably have more questions in Moncton, but I'm just going to cut it up or cut it off here for Skype. But thank you so much for presenting. It was very interesting and we learned a lot. Thank you.